I chose the emoji with the heart eyes because I love seeing how you know, if 22 people can work on one document and then magically Kate, our, our magically sparkly unicorn of a business manager slash HR specialist, um, pulls together the budget book, which you've all had a chance to read. So I'm just so proud of the work that this team does. Um, and then this kind of silly, one-eye, open, winky, tongue-sticking-out face, because it's like you never know what's really going to happen over the next few weeks. Um, but <laughs> we feel really good about where we are now, um, and we're ready to get started. So you'll do that with two other people. Your story might be better than mine, or more detailed than mine, um, and that's that's up to you to decide how you're going to do that. So you have two people who you might not know very well, or who you haven't connected with recently. So board members are probably not going to connect with board members. You want to find leadership council, right? <laughs> okay. So officially, we will. Are you ready? Yep. All right. There's no gavel, but still calling the meeting to order. Thank you. It's the workshop for the initial launch of the fiscal year 20 budget. Can I have the attendance, please? April Sider. Here. Leanne Kozlonis. Here. Alicia Giftos. Here. Uh, Hillary Durgan. Here. Sarah Layton. Here. Amy Glidden. Here. Nick Gill. Here. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand And Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now I'll turn this over to Julie to facilitate the workshop. Great. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so I already gave the directions. I'm going to set the timer so that we stay on track. We're going to have five minutes just to get up and move around, um, and then you'll come back to your seats um, after you've spoken to two people. Okay. Feel free to grab a coffee or a snack in your five minutes. Go ahead. Find two people who you want to tell your story. Yeah, I just 
funny too. <laughs> and this guy. Yeah, that's the one that I have Hello? You have about one minute before we're going to come back together. So if you haven't talked to your second person yet, you want to find your second person. One minute. <laughs> Okay, you should start wrapping up your conversation and heading back to your seats. Wow, you guys are awesome, right on time. <laughs> So I always like to think about how can how can I model strategies that principals and directors could take back to their staff and I think that this is a really fun one that you could adapt and adjust in a lot of ways to use at staff meetings or curriculum meetings. Um, and just a fun way to get people having conversations with folks that they might not always connect with. Um, and it gets people up and moving right before we get started. So um, we do have this microphone. There are also four mics around the room so that as we get to the question and comments part, those can be heard for those who are watching at home. This is also being recorded so that folks can access it on demand at a later time. But what I'll do is if we could just pass this mic around so that everyone um, who's presenting can be heard really clearly, I think that would be um, helpful. So I'm going to pass it over to Kathy Terrell. Good morning. Good morning. First, I just want to bring attention to our note taker today is Allison Marchese, and our process backup is Jessica Steele. So I want to go over the norms today. So we're going to take an inquiry stance. That means you guys are going to ask lots of questions. We're going to ground the statements in evidence, assume positive intentions. We're all here to do what's best for students. We're going to stick to the protocol and hear all voices, and I'll go over the protocol in a minute. Try to start and end on time. I'm the timekeeper, so I'll also, the biggest part of facilitating today is that time piece. Be here now and enjoy the learning. So our protocol today is we're going to have two departments or phases share out um, 10 minutes each. I will give each presenter a one minute warning and then there will be 10 minutes of questions and answers. So if you would look in your packet, you'll see that there are some worksheets entitled Noticings and Wonderings for you to take your notes on. So while people are presenting, you can jot down some things you notice, things you're wondering about and any questions you have. There will be some stretch breaks built in and what we'll do is we'll see how our time is going 
and then um, modify the stretch break time if we have some extra, take a little bit longer break. So I want you to keep in mind our ACE habits of mind as um, we're working. So we're, mo we're working to move the budget forward. That's our shared commitment to action. This intentional collaboration of this group working together and the relentless focus on evidence that the department heads will share with you today. So I want to go over just some of the pluses and deltas from last year's meetings, things that went well and things that the group would have changed. The agenda format worked well, at least at the start. We really started going over that 10 minutes. Um, they loved the budget book. It was clear, readable, and digestible. There was a lot of good engagement and discussions and that K-12 perspective with everybody being here. Some of the things they'd change is have this meeting prior to the first reading, which we have, which we have done. Um, have the budget book ahead of time, so hopefully you got your copy before this meeting. And then have shorter sessions spread out over time. Last year it was one long meeting and we ran out of time, so then we, had, we finished up with a second meeting. So this time we planned two meetings right off the bat. And then add more time for each speaker and questions. Instead of adding more time, because last year we spent about seven hours, we have five and a half scheduled now. So instead of giving speakers more time, really ask all speakers to try to keep it to 10 minutes. And then we, it was five minutes for questions last year, and you're going to have 10. Um, you also will be given an exit slip at the end, just in case any question you had, you weren't able to ask. And so what we did the second time is we did make the presentation shorter and more time for questions. And something that was um, shared at the end of the second meeting was make sure that you go around the table and it's really about hearing all voices. So during the question time, we'll make sure that everybody has had a chance to ask a question. <coughs> So the objectives today is really for you to come away from this meeting with a deep understanding of the proposed budget. So each presenter will talk about last year's return on investments, some successes, some facts, and possibly some research, and then share what this budget proposal allows us to do provide. And then they'll talk about any unmet needs in the proposal. At the end of the meeting today, there'll be some time and there'll be more time during tomorrow's meeting to talk about um, talking points and critical message to be shared with our community. The one point I would just add is really our intent over the next two days is for you all to become really, really deeply engaged with the budget so that we can start the conversation after the first reading, which you'll have your first reading on Thursday, and then the town council will have their first reading um, next Wednesday. And so this is really just no expectation of you to know and understand the full budget yet. My turn? We're early. Go data wise. Yeah. Budget book orientation. So, um, excuse me if I stand up. I don't want to cover over people, but it also helps me not sit for four hours. Um, first of all, I've, I've had some really nice feedback on the budget book and um, the board members who were able to pick it up and take a look at it ahead of time. So I think everybody got it at least a little bit in advance. And um, I just want to say that I so appreciate the feedback positive feedback that it's a, it's an entertaining read or that it's uh, you know attractive and it's easy to follow um, but I, I most definitely in this room in front of everyone I want to say it's not me it's this whole team and people who aren't at the table yet today that you'll see tomorrow who put this together um, I'm the editor I'm not the creator so 
kudos to all of my friends and colleagues for uh, putting together something that we hope will resonate with the public, will be understandable, and will help people support our budget. So today, you have the budget book as a tool for the workshop. Um, I believe that my colleagues will probably say, you know, if you want to know more about this, take a look at page 42, um, because they've really engaged deeply in creating the, the book and putting as much information as they can into it. So um, I think you've all seen it enough to know how to orient yourself. Um, there's a table of contents in the front. There's an executive summary. The superintendent's introduction has a lot of the high-level conversations that we've had about budget goals, budget challenges, um, what, the, the, um, what the process has been like to create this budget. And uh, then you get into the departments, and the departments are telling their own individual stories, the schools and, and uh, departments of the district. And at the very end, there's a line item budget. Um, and I was saying to someone this morning that, that that used to be the whole budget. You, you got your line items and, and you hopefully figured out what they meant. Uh, it, was, it was gravy for all of us accounting nerds. It was useless for pretty much everyone else. So we're grateful to have a little bit more context there. Um, so as you go along, um, I encourage you, the reason that I've, I've gone old school and given you paper with binders is to encourage you to take notes, to scribble, to put sticky notes around. There's sticky notes on the table. Um, and I will be adding information as we go along through this process. Um, we'll be giving, <coughs> giving you other documents. We'll be giving you handouts. We'll be giving you um, other pieces of information. And I'm hoping that this makes a place for you to sort of pull everything together and, and hang on to it as a resource. If you're a, a super digital user, then good for you. And I appreciate that. And all of this stuff will also be available digitally as we go through the process. I'm at the same time here. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I'm just going to quickly review our vision, mission, and values um, as the foundation of our work. Uh, while the table is one um, metaphor that you could use, when any organization is looking to make improvements, when any organization is looking to move forward, these four pieces need to be coherent. They need to be um, in line with the actions within an organization. So I'm just going to remind you of these pieces, and as the school board makes decisions in and around this budget, you can use these as moorings or channel markers in your decision making. So our mission, why we exist, it's really about each and every student, and you'll hear that theme throughout this budget process. It's really about empowering those students to become resilient, lifelong learners. Likewise, our vision is really about becoming a high quality, forward-looking school district. In order to do that in this day and age, we've got to have a continuous improvement mindset. And we've used those four strategic themes, effective teaching and learning, safe and inclusive schools, global citizenship, and community engagement to guide our decision-making in and around the budget to make sure that we're addressing all four. And our values, we want to make sure that we're all in line with what we believe in our values, and our values are all about all students, each and every within our mission, all students within our collective commitments, and it's really about their becoming um, civic and college and career ready. We have three large goals that we organize around. The first district goal is really about having a process in place to effectively utilize data to make these improvements. And we did not have a process in place we now have the start of a process in order to make those decisions. So we're making sure, so that we can make sure that we're making good decisions. This is detail in and around that process. Another goal that we have is about organizing for collaborative work. Looking at data is hard work. It's risky business. We may not want to look at some of the pieces of data that we need to look at. And so building that environment where it's safe to take a look at that data and safe to further explore and ask tough questions of ourselves, this step is very important. And thirdly, the buildings each have goals that they're working from and they're reporting on and they're working through this process. 
So that's a brief overview of our goals and our mission, vision, values, and how they can be used to help support us in making decisions in and around this budget. I guess Monique and I should have sat next to each other. <laughs> so this is a quick overview of the budget as a whole. Um, just a few sort of points to ponder. We're starting with the aim of the budget, um, and uh, the district leadership folks have gotten together early in December to talk about what we are trying to accomplish with the budget proposal, what our big challenges would be. So the aim of the budget, develop a budget increase that is student-centered and fiscally responsible, always a balancing act. Uh, address and support current programmatic and enrollment needs, and then respond to growth in the community and the district. So looking forward and trying to be future ready. I've got a little chart in here. Um, some of the conversations that we've had recently with uh, various school board teams have been about how much work really goes into this process. And um, you can see this chart shows you all of the bits and pieces in the time that we've spent. Um, Upwards of 20 hours individually with each phase and department stands out for me. That's a couple of weeks of uh, very intense line item review. And, uh, but all of the other pieces go into informing where the budget proposal lands in the end. Um, and now we're into April and we have the first public presentation and the project continues. Do I know how to use this? Yes, I do. So in the beginning of the budget, the public portion of the budget process, we have the superintendent's introduction. Um, the superintendent and the town manager tomorrow will be having a, a public presentation of the budget, which is the first sort of official public rollout of the entire municipal budget. And uh, the superintendent's introduction in the book teaches us about the budget drivers, the challenges, and some of the highlights of the budget process that led us to create the proposal that is before you. Um, we have really had a lot of conversations and focus around enrollment and, uh, and high levels of student need in various areas. And you'll hear some more about that more directly from my colleagues today. One of the things we were able to produce last year was the one pager, which was actually the front and back of one page, um, which outlined what was in the budget, what was an unmet need, and then some of the other high-level charts of, of uh, the budget proposal that we could share with the public in a number of ways. And so we'll be working on that again this year as well. It's not quite as uh, simple a one-pager this year, we, but we do have some, some starting pieces to that. And uh, the last piece I have on there is cost drivers, and we have a, a handout here that we shared with the Finance Committee. I have an updated version of that that <laughs> folks can take if they want some background information. I've got quite a few handouts because I am the paper queen, so I'm, I'm not going to try passing them around and confusing the day, but uh, we'll have more things available. Then the next steps in the process. Uh, we have items in motion, which we talk about. It's a sort of one of those air quotes kind of things. Items in motion means there are things that are happening in the outside world that will affect this budget uh, that we don't really have control over. So Anthem is gonna give us their rates for Scarborough in another week or so. Um, there are other outstanding rate issues. There's property casualty insurance. There's um, dental insurance. There's workers' compensation insurance. And there's debt service. So there's quite a few things that will happen to us and that we will adjust between now and the time that we get to second reading. Uh, the finance committee, I should probably say finance committees, our finance committee will be having two meetings between now and second reading, along with all of the other school board budget meetings that we have. And we'll be doing a deeper dive into what's in the proposal and what will go forward to second reading and vote. The town, of course, will be giving us some input on what they think the school budget should look like. And then once we actually have a final proposal, we're going out to the neighborhoods to have some communication and outreach. Um, and we have already had some listen to learn sessions with the neighborhoods and the school staff. And now we're going to uh, reach out again and say, okay, here's what we heard, here's what we've developed, and here's where we landed, and we'd like y'all to support this. 
this chart tells you everything you need to know, right? This is, this, <laughs> this is the summary that the good old days was just the cover page of the budget and we'd all go home. This tells you the general fund operating budget, which is the K-12 budget, that's the budget that the voters vote on in referendum in June, uh, is the top line. But we also have an adult education budget and a school nutrition budget. For each one of those, we have offsetting non-tax revenues, which is the second to the bottom line. And at the bottom is the change in what we will be asking for from the town for taxes based on this first reading budget. Again, this is the first reading, so there will be changes that happen between now and second reading. Uh, but this is what the proposal does dollar-wise. Um, the piece that's not included in here is the capital budget because the uh, tax request on the capital budget is set by the town depending on the project. Kate, could you also just explain that this is only part of what will be coming though, right? Um, I just wanted to mention that the capital budget is on page 79 in the budget book. See, there's your first budget book reference. Throw a pitch in there. Um, so as Julie says, this is only the school's portion of the municipal budget. And so there's a very large, um, complex tax comp rate sheet that's developed by the town finance office, which tells us what they think the actual increase to the tax rate for the citizens of Scarborough will be at the end of the day. Um, the town council has set a goal of uh, no more than a 3% increase on the tax rate this year. Um, at the moment, at first reading, I'm not the person who sets that number. I think we're probably higher than 3% right now, and we'll hear more about that uh, tomorrow night uh, at the town manager's presentation. But the 5.71% will not translate directly to 5.71% increase in the tax rate. It has to be added to the town's budget, there's a county budget, there's offsetting revenues on the town side, and there's a change in valuation on the town side. So April has a really nice uh, little formula that we're going to put somewhere for sure because <laughs> uh, it will help people understand that this is only a piece of the overall budget. Thank you. Um, in the area of curriculum and instruction, a uh, couple of successes to mention. Um, the data-wise improvement process that I mentioned as part of our goals has been quite successful. It is starting to become what we do. And you can see that in our common format for agendas, our protocols, uh, and you'll also see it in our decision making as well. K-5 classroom libraries are another success story for the first time, I think, for since I've certainly been here. We now have equitable core classroom libraries for all students, including small classrooms, support rooms, academic support, as well as the general classroom. Uh, STEM programming has reached K-8. So 99.9% .9 of our students engage in STEM programming across K-8. Also, quality instruction and coordination of the curriculum has been moving along, and that is in direct result of our framework for our curriculum guide. Instructional coaches are working with staff to build those instructional units. They're also working with staff in doing and helping them with their SLOs. We call those coaching cycles where they pre-plan with teachers. They might go in, model lessons, co-teach, and then reflect and look at the student performance shift as a result. Can you describe what an SLO is? Oh, I'm so sorry. An SLO is a student learning objective. Uh, and that is part of the teacher growth plan. And that has teachers taking a look at where their students start, then they provide instruction and take a look at where their students' growth, what their students' growth looks like. <clears throat> In terms of this budget, what it allows us to do, it really does allow us to maintain current programming and enhance some student opportunities. <clears throat> so we're going to continue to look at classroom libraries and provide some choices for teachers in terms of titles. Um, to continue to meet and benefit those students um, who have certain interests or reading levels. We're going to build upon the STEM curriculum, and you'll see those new investments in the high school 
presentation, we also want to expand authentic opportunities for students to help them transition into the world of work and career eventually. Um, and so you'll see that in a new high school proposal as well. Also, this budget allows us to provide equitable staff student ratios across the grade level so all students can engage in high quality instruction. And that you will see at K2 and special services in terms of the investments there. And then we are also introducing, um, it will be this spring into the fall, a data analytics software so that those folks who are learning how to use data will be able to access the data they need across the district. Some unmet needs, uh, adding equitable learning opportunities and address grounds maintenance. This was a um, position that Todd and I worked on. We have a wonderful school garden at Wentworth School. We have several gardens in the other schools that are in disarray. Uh, the school garden at Wentworth is the result of volunteer efforts and grants that we've been um, gathering to help support that. And at a certain point in time, I'd like to see that um, operationalized and part of the school budget. Uh, it will also allow us to provide more equitable opportunities for students in uh, <clears throat> environmental science. Right now, those teachers who are interested in that opportunity have those students access the gardens, and we want all students to be able to benefit from engaging in learning experience in those gardens. Also, um, <clears throat> becoming more efficient in managing and maximizing our online applications. As I shared with the board early on, more and more of curriculum materials are becoming online applications and having sufficient support staff to manage those applications is a challenge. So we have a little bit of a backlog there. Uh, and lastly, expanding opportunities for teachers and staff professional learning. And that comes both in the form of participation as more national conferences, but also in terms of additional time for staff to be learning. So those are the unmet needs. While we have unmet needs, we are moving forward incrementally and we're maximizing the resources that we do have. And Jeff, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. The um, IT department success and facts. Whoops. Okay. There have been a lot of changes in our department this year. We had to say goodbye to our director of seven years, Jennifer Day. But the good news is we have a new director, Don Bijin. Don is from Colorado and has worked in several school districts throughout the country. He has retired from 20 years of service in the military. Our efforts to provide improved customer service and support in the schools was successful following the hiring of the three new field technicians. They were instrumental in the support of MEA testing. One administrator commented, commented that this has been the best testing year yet. Thank you, Monique. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go Guardian, the web filtering and self-harms alert system currently in use at middle school and high school, was implemented at the beginning of the year. The system alerts the administrators when a student is searching for questionable or self-harm sites. Once alerted, the administrator is able to view the web history of the student that triggered the alert and take action if needed. Wireless access points and a phone system upgrade were also completed. The FY20 budget. High school devices are to be replaced as part of the 2020 budget. Following a one year delay in the phase level replacement cycle due to budget constraints in the previous year. Additional devices required to compensate for increases in student and staff population are also included in the 2020 budget. During the year, we are always maintaining and replacing equipment that is beyond economical repair. Our unmet needs. Our unmet needs include student and staff level file encryption as well as more efficient management console solutions. Transition to a Google-based file encryption system will be necessary to become fully compliant with federal and state student <coughs> data privacy regulations. More efficient management console solutions allow the IT department to establish and monitor permissions, maintain software and applications, <coughs> and ensure compliance of devices and software in accordance with federal and state regulations while maintaining current, current staff levels. Consolidating and increasing the efficiency with, with electronic online forms 
to decrease the amount of paperwork required from students, parents, and staff will be essential in the near future. The use of digital signatures and electronic file storage is required by current regulations in this area. Any questions? Wonderings and questions? Should we pass this? See anybody? So hopefully as you've heard those past two presentations, curriculum and instruction and IT, you've been jotting some of your noticings, some of your wonderings. Um, are there questions that you have at the moment that you would like to ask of either Monique or the IT department? Hillary? Um, I was just wondering, Monique, if you could speak to, I noticed that um, one of your unmet needs was some professional development um, time or uh, opportunity. Can you speak a little bit about how much the, our membership in the GSEA um, contributes to our opportunities and cost savings for professional development? Well, at, at present, we're not members, but we're sort okay. of invited friends. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they have sponsored a, um, a staff development opportunity this year, and we had about half a dozen or so folks from our district participate. Um, it basically a book study um, and three workshop sessions. Uh, so they offer events, not a whole slew of events, but targeted specific events that would benefit across all schools. Okay. Actually, if I could add to that. One of the things that's coming up um, next year with the Greater Sebago Education Alliance is a leadership academy. And so each, each member district will have the opportunity to send seven um, staff members. And the idea is they, these are formal and informal leaders. So it can be teachers, it can be assistant principals, it can be principals. And we're really trying to build that leadership pipeline. This is done through um, an organization called LSI. And uh, Joanne and I, Diane, also Kathy, had the chance to sit in the overview presentation, which was held in this room. We hosted over 80 or 70 people in this room, because that's the math. Um, and, <laughs> and all had a chance to hear about this. And I, already, multiple districts, ourselves included, are saying, can we get more than seven seats? Because we think it's going to be such an amazing learning opportunity for our staff. And it's at a massively discounted rate. So if we were to engage in this three-year cohort just as a singleton, Scarborough alone, it would cost us upwards of $30,000 easily. Um, but because we're partners, um, or we anticipate becoming partner members of the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, it allows us to um, engage seven staff members at $875 per person for three <coughs> to three-year cohort. And so if you can imagine the high level of leadership development that's going to happen within that <coughs> plus the networking that comes with it, um, it's really going to be an amazing opportunity. Another question? Monique, I, I was wondering what the, um, when you talked about data analytics, what, who uses that and, and what's the data that you're analyzing? At present, um, it's still in development. I have a phone call next week about moving it off of development and making it available. It contains student test score data and subscore data. It also pulls from our student information system, student demographic information. It also has the ability to add early warning indicators for students. So it's a way of merging our student information systems into a reporting site that people can take a look at and compare a student's uh, discipline information versus their test scores versus their current grade scores so that we can better understand students and then plan for them. So is that done at the administrative level? It would be done and available at all levels. So a classroom teacher, when they would log in, they would be able to see their students' previous data whether that be report card data or test score data, so they would better understand students from the start. At the building level, it would, may well be used for data teamwork to take a look at building goals and metrics around building goals. We're planning on entering, uh, K-5 has a writing goal, for example, this year. So we're planning on entering our baseline writing data in there by student, um, and then our post data so that we could do um, some analysis, um, both on an individual student basis, but also in terms of group. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Can you, is that a specific, like, program? It's a specific it's product. 
That's what uh, I mean. Yes, it was, it was a module offered under the parent company of our student information system, PowerSchool. Okay, it's called Performance Matters. That's yeah. my question. So it does, it talks to PowerSchool. Yes, okay. yes, that was um, one reason why we went with it. Mm -hmm. I have an IT question. Um, it, you said that you're going to replace the high school devices. What do you do with the old devices? Um, well, sometimes they go to roof reusable. Or we try, oh, sorry. Uh, sometimes we're trying to find um, ways to use them in carts and stuff. We use them as extras sometimes, and then we replace hard drives in that so that we can reuse them. Do you, do you have a plan for, for this year what you're going to do? Uh, no, yeah, we haven't really talked about it yet. We want to see the condition of the laptops and that. Dan, I actually have an IT question as well. Um, you had mentioned one of the unmet needs of not having the file encryption. Right. What, what are the risks to the district by not having the file encryption process in place? Well, um, the risk is someone reading um, a sensitive document. Uh, currently, we're using Microsoft and we're uh, putting passwords on there, but using Virtue is an easier transition than using the Microsoft product. Other questions? Any other questions? I, I have a, a follow-up question for the data. Um, Are you saying that currently with the PowerSchool um, software that we have that teachers cannot go back cannot go into power school and see prior years or um, log entries that might be put in for disciplinary reasons? Uh, no, they can go in and take a look at that, but because it's primarily a database, it doesn't allow you to do the data analytics in terms of comparing data sets, and that's what this program allows us to do. I have another question for Michelle real quick. Um, the Go Guardian that you mentioned, is that a, um, program that we bought and own, or is that something that we um, subscribe to every year? And can you talk about how you um, measure how successful that's been? Well, this is, um, actually, you can tell me how successful it was. Um, Go Guardian is a subscription okay. um, service that we use that's in the cloud. Um, excuse me. It allows the principals to view the data from wherever they are, mm -hmm. so it's not restricted that way. And how successful it is, I'm going to uh, talk to Diana on that. Okay. Sure. So, Go Guardian has been a great asset to us at the middle school this year. Um, prior to this year, we didn't have that 24 7 capability to monitor a device. Once a device was outside of our network, um, it was just on your own personal network, right? Mm -hmm. And so Go Guardian um, is not specific to being on school grounds. Um, I can cite several instances where it's been extremely helpful. Um, if we think about self-harm, for example, I have received self-harm notifications as well as Dave over the weekend, at night. Um, I've been out to dinner and will get a notification and that allows me in real time to be able to reach out to that family to make a contact. Are you home with your child right now? They're searching how to commit suicide, mm -hmm. um, you know, something such as that. So that in of itself is hugely powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Any comments or wondering, noticing? from what you've heard so far? So we're really ahead of schedule. Um, what we're gonna do is take a little break. Um, Kath, what time is it? It is 9.21, so let's take a 10 minute break, 9.31. Come back together around 9.31-ish. Feel free to connect with someone else, <coughs> share your emoji story that you created this morning. Certainly help yourself to snacks. The restrooms are right out the door around the corner. I think everyone knows where those are. Um, and we'll come back together around 9.31.
Okay, as we come back together, we're gonna dig into Scarborough athletics and activities. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Mike Legage, <coughs> Director of Athletics and Activities. Well, thank you all, and I'm happy to share the athletics and activities, which starts on page 61 in your budget book. Um, if you'd like to look around, look, look along. Um, Um, so, I think one of the biggest highlights is certainly our uh, participation rate. Just to get a um, understanding of that, it's really highly unusual to have above 50 percent. And so, we're really fortunate that we have. I think about 68% of students participating after school activities at the middle school, and then about 90% of students that participate in some after school activity at the high school. Um, that's kind of an estimate. We don't track club activities in family ID uh, like we do at the middle level. At the middle level, students that uh, participate in a school-sponsored activity all register through Family ID, whether it's a club activity or athletics. We only use that registration program for athletics at the high school right now. Um, so part of that is an estimate based on what the club advisors report to us, their enrollment numbers. Um, in terms of, I, I think that's probably the biggest success story, um, is that level of involvement. But also certainly, um, it's highly unusual that in athletics you have success in terms of um, championships, if you measure success that way. Um, it's highly unusual that we have the numbers that we have in that as well. Most every team makes postseason tournament play. Um, that does require a level of financial support. Um, there's no question. Um, but we're very fortunate. Um, we've had, I think, two or three state championships so far this year, so we're a little down. Um, uh, it's really unusual for somebody to say they have won. Um, we historically have anywhere between six and ten state championships a year. Um, we're also very fortunate to have um, strong booster support. Um, not only in athletics, but also groups like the band boosters, things such as that. So we have uh, probably around 500 or so volunteers through boosters. Um, it's a little over 20 booster groups. And um, they all have varying levels of support. Some are smaller than others. Um, and some are quite large. Uh, boosters collectively raise um, <coughs> about $300,000 to support programs. One of, one of our goals and our last the goal for actually my last 10 years here has been to reduce dependence on parent support groups and we've we're on a trajectory towards that certainly um, but we still have a lot of programs that rely on booster support for essential components of the program so in other words if we didn't have the booster support we wouldn't be able to offer the program um, and so we're, we're, we're on a kind of a trajectory towards um, that changing, but we're not 100% there yet. Um, so some of the things that we've done this year that have been exciting is um, our live streaming of events has really picked up. And that's gone through our office. We live stream, as you know, uh, graduation and Oak Hill Players Productions and different things in the auditorium as well as athletics. In the athletic area, we've included, and you can see in the picture there, we've included students in that, students that are interested in studying um, after high school broadcast journalism or things of that nature. And so we've gotten them involved in 
um, sort of a live stream club, if you will, albeit, um, you know, not, not fully sanctioned or financially supported um, in terms of an advisor in the traditional sense. Um, but we've been able to, to do that. Um, Mr. Crowley has donated his time to do that. Mr. Huntington is very involved as well. And I think they do a good job. If anybody has seen a live stream event, you can hear the kids um, talking about it. And they, they just do a super job. It's become a, a, an important part of what we do. And they're going to continue that. They, they've had some meetings already about what they're going to do maybe this spring and into next fall. Um, I think our use of technology has increased, um, helped in our efficiencies and our communication, uh, and also with our coaches. Most of our coaches now, <coughs> it's been a process, but most of our coaches now have, has a, have a school email, so they no longer <coughs> have personal emails, um, you know, to do school-related business. Um, and, you know, we've started things like a, a newsletter and an athlete of the month program and those sorts of things. So those, um, that, that's been exciting that you can read about in there as well. Um, we have in the past, um, because of the change in the collective buying agreement and the increase in the teacher base pay, we did have some funds added um, in this year's budget to um, offset those stipends, as you know, uh, stipends are, are start based on the teacher base pay. It's a percentage of the teacher base pay. So if that changes, then athletic activity stipends change. Um, we did allocate some money for contracted buses. Unfortunately, um, the transportation dilemma um, greatly impacts after school activities. So any time that we want a bus before 4 o'clock, which is a majority <coughs> of our events, um, we're looking at a lot of times a contracted bus for that. Um, so we've been able to, um, we had some money in this year's budget that really uh, supported that. Um, we have some, we, we certainly have a vision um, for our department and um, that information is outlined in great detail in your budget book, so I won't review that, but um, I think it's what drives us. And, you know, it's all around uh, a, a certain culture and the climate that we want to create. Um, and I feel like the things that we're doing are working based on students' involvement, based on um, other measures of, of success. In terms of this year's budget, um, we um, certainly the dis district-wide needs have, um, you know, we've needed to um, look at um, those things that are supported in our, our budget. So the district not why needs have certainly dictated the funds uh, to be allocated in different cost centers for this year, but we're, we're glad that we're staying um, the course uh, and not looking at uh, going backwards, uh, which at this point we would, we would likely have to look at programs. Um, we're really at the point where I, I've said in the past we we can't really buy any less balls and bats. Um, and so we'd be looking at programs. This um, budget doesn't do some things for us. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have to look at unified basketball a different way, alpine skiing a different way. Um, we're going to have to uh, hopefully be able to continue with some of the sports casting activities and do that. Um, through volunteers and, and those sorts of things. One of the things that we've been wanting to do over a number of years is have a development director that we'd be able to look at that person really uh, supporting boosters, the, the work of boosters, but also looking at other opportunities for um, income that would be stable. Um, so 
and we've been working with Todd uh, and, and his department because we unfortunately do pull custodians away from their regular job responsibilities at times to support events in the building. Um, we do that with community services and we do that um, within the school building as well and custodial staff. So we're very fortunate to have a good relationship with community services. And so as you know, the facilities are really managed by community services. Um, and we you know, work with them um, to help support um, investments in those areas, but also the use of those areas. The external facilities. Mike. The external facilities. The internal facilities, we manage the external facilities community service managers. And I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my department uh, oversees uh, the maintenance and operations of all the buildings, and I wouldn't be doing my Aristotle County Potato Farmer Boy Heritage justice if I didn't talk about the buildings in terms of square feet, but that's boring, so I'll convert it to farmer language and say there are over 15 and a half acres of interior building space in Scarborough that we take care of. And our success, I believe, in the facilities department is the fact that we accomplish a lot with a few. So there are 26 and a half full-time equivalent custodians and four maintenance people. And that means the custodian will have about half an acre of building space to cover, <laughs> which is about 25,000 square feet. Um, and that's about 3,000 square feet above the national standard for custodial cleaning. So we, we do do more with less uh, statistically. Same with our maintenance folks. There's four. We have six buildings, four people. Um, you'll often see me in the buildings doing strange things as well, cleaning and fixing. Um, but our cost drivers truly are our wages and benefits. We have, um, that's our largest uh, cost driver in the, in the department is people. Um, behind that, it would be uh, utilities, heating fuels, uh, water, sewer. Um, it costs money to run these places. And we consider ourselves an essential operation because uh, without the building space and the heat and the lights and the technology and the wiring, you wouldn't be able to do much in those buildings. So um, we are essential, but we are uh, here because <coughs> 3,000 plus people using these buildings every day. Um, the second uh, big driver would be uh, electricity and utilities and uh, things like that, and then the building envelope itself, which is really the shell of the building, walls, windows. I include roofing in there. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of square feet of roof that we have to maintain as well. Um, areas of focus for the facilities department, safety and security has become really the top-notch uh, piece for us. We have in the past year upgraded our access management system, which is the card access you swipe to get into the buildings. Um, that's all uh, new software running that. We did not have to change the hardware at the doors, but we did change the server unit in, inside the buildings. Um, we are continuously adding and replacing video surveillance equipment. The cameras at the high school are nearing 12, 13 years old, um, and so we're constantly trying to keep those so that you get a clear picture of what's happening in the building. Um, it helps us to solve problems um, that happen in the building, um, and we often get reimbursed for damages done to the building by the perpetrators. <laughs> um, we've also improved um, some of the communication system, the PA system, for example, in the alumni gym. Uh, we provide radios for communication within the buildings, which is extremely helpful during safety instances and so forth. So um, item B on this operational efficiency with a service focus, we really do as much as we can ourselves before contracting out the work, but because of the systems and their technicality, um, it, it often requires a, a certified technician for servicing cooling and heating units. Um, 
certainly the cameras and that type of infrastructure requires technicians but we do for the larger systems have preventive maintenance contracts which helps prolong the life of equipment for example the heat pumps at the middle school are now twenty three years old they have a useful life of fifteen to twenty years but because of our maintenance of them they've lasted longer but we do need to replace those and you'll see money in my capital budget asking for that supplies utility procurement really we have a work order system that teachers can use and access and staff and it keeps our keeps our staff busy but efficiently handling everything I'd like to think we get the most work orders within twenty four to forty eight hours unless it's a really long range request that has a lot to it we also do all the snow removal this is last year's statistics but I think it's interesting to know that every time it snows our five person if you count me crew because I'm here for all the storms covered five entrances thirteen stairs eighteen fire lanes and fourteen ramps district wide we don't plow the parking lots that's Risberra Brothers has that contract with their big equipment but we do all the other stuff and it's a lot of hand work and not so nice weather usually so another focus I have is on energy efficiency constantly trying to upgrade electrical components so that we save money on electricity same with fuel combustion management systems help save fuel and we do take advantage when we're upgrading things of any efficiency main incentives that we can the LED lights for example if you walk into the high school in the main lobby you'll see the two by two squares those are all brand new LED lights they're about they're saving forty to fifty percent energy wise the alumni gym is another one we worked with Mike to get a a light that would provide the same quality of light for a lot less money and so all forty eight lamps in alumni have been replaced as well this past year uh, next slide I guess I'm running this aren't I <laughs> <coughs> The other component, I only have two slides because Mike took four, so I gave him one. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pop them um, we, we do do a lot of work with Mike's uh, department because he's here in the after hours, and he's right that we, we do help him out, and uh, he provides job security for us, so it's great. He's got, he's got the buildings wide open until late at night, and so our staff does help. But my the second half or part of my proposals and in, in budgeting is really capital improvements and I have pictures which might bore you uh, but it's equipment um, there's a picture there about a snow removal day that was last year not this past winter but the winter before um, the upper right hand picture is an auto scrubber um, as you might imagine with 15 acres of floors uh, you can't just be swinging a mop like Carol Burnett did years ago <laughs> um, you have to have a piece of equipment um, that can run over that uh, and clean it more effectively so that's an auto scrubber that machine there's uh, a larger size and it's close to ten thousand dollars for one of those but they last for seven or eight years so it's not like we're spending that every single year but we do have a number of those throughout the district to help keep the schools clean I do hear a lot of people uh, I had to meet with an engineer this year who is from off-site he was doing an evaluation of an energy efficiency audit for our boilers and he walked, I had to take him to the high school, and he walked into the high school, and he said, geez, is this building brand new? And I said, no, 2005 is when it was renovated, and he was amazed at the way it looked. And I often get uh, the comments from other folks coming from other districts that the buildings look really clean and well-maintained, and, and that's a tribute to the staff that uh, works in those buildings every night. Um, the lower left is the sixth grade portable building, um, 12 classrooms there. They're 40% uh, more expensive to operate, um, but with their necessary evil. They're the only short-term solution to increase volume of students um, and program changes. So the lower right is uh, a boiler at the middle school that we replaced and renewed <coughs> last uh, two years ago. Um, one of those boilers, there's two in each of the K-2 schools and two in every other school. One of those boilers is you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars to replace, thirty-year lifespan. Okay, so our department spends money, uh, but it actually tries to do it in the most efficient way. Um, classroom space. Again, we're looking at eight corners this year to add some additional classroom space for the expanded <coughs> enrollment as well as uh, special use program use changes. 
and um, I'm always asking for building repairs, which include all the things listed there uh, that cost a lot of money. For example, the skylights at the middle school gym, about a $66,000 uh, job to replace three of them, which leak perpetually. Mm. Again, 23 years old, requires replacement. If you want a nice working in environment for students and staff, you have to stay after these types of things. So uh, those are the types of things we do. Um, I welcome any questions. Okay. So this is our chance to share some of those jottings that you've been um, keeping through the last two presentations. And if it triggers something that you want to ask a principal or you want to ask maybe one of the Monique or um, Michelle from IT, you can certainly go back or forward in your thinking too. My question is for Todd. I, I'm interested in hearing about um, maybe some longitudinal trend information regarding the, um, the, the CIP recommended amounts and you're asking for significantly less than what the CIP might recommend for the value of our facilities. So I'm wondering over time um, if you have any information in terms of is that common that you're asking for that much less and then talk about the impact that has on the state of our facilities today. Um, so yes, the, uh, I think the reference Amy's making is that the State Department of Education recommends that school departments spend 2% of the value of their overall physical plant annually on capital improvements. So if you place the value on our physical plant at 150 million, which is an approximate number, and it's based on a, a several year old data, so I would argue that our plant is actually worth more than that, but for the number that we have, 150 million, that would basically uh, suggest that we should be spending three million a year on capital improvements for the schools and we have not done that. Um, largely it's because of competing priorities within the town um, and the amount of debt service the town chooses to take on as a result of these capital requests. Uh, for example, I'll give one, one <coughs> uh, the competing priority within the school department uh, a few years ago when the school department decided to go to the one-to-one -one computing at the high school. Uh, the facilities department asked for less to help offset the cost of the laptop program uh, for folks at the high school. Um, but in terms of the long-term impact, uh, deferring maintenance, for example, on essential things like roofs and heating units uh, is going to, at some point, come back and, and bite you and require you to spend even more. And I think I made this point when I presented to the board uh, a few weeks ago regarding capital requests. The longer you wait when a system fails, like a, a heating component, it's not going to fail in July. It's going to fail in January. <laughs> and then it's considered emergent, emergent and almost catastrophic in that you have to do all these things to keep the building warm and prevent it from freezing and allow classes to continue while doing a large capital project right in the middle of things. And, and so it becomes more expensive. So I, I would say a consequence of avoiding those types of expenditures uh, before the problem happens is it's, it's going to have a long tail and it's going to come back and, and, and it's going to have a little snap to it. And so we haven't asked for that amount of money because we've pretty much known we aren't going to get it um, in our budget requests. Um, it's expensive to run buildings. When you have 680,000 square feet of building space, they don't run themselves for free. Uh, but at the same time, you have to keep them in. Um, so this year, you're noticing an extra uh, larger than in the past ask. We're asking for 1.9 million, I think, overall in capital, if I'm correct. Um, for facilities things because for so many years we have not been asking. This year it's becoming critical that we get it so that we can get it before it fails. Yeah. A lot of that is uh, for the middle school heat pumps. There are 123 heat pumps at the middle school. They have a useful life of 15, maybe 18 years, and they're now many of them 23 years old. So trying to fix them before they break. So for the board, the very last page of the budget book has a history of 
uh, CIP capital improvement project spending uh, for the past several years. And so you can see that uh, the year that, that Todd is referencing where um, facilities took a, a back seat to technology was FY16, but really over that, that span of years, there really hasn't been any facilities investment uh, over a million dollars in any year and in uh, capital projects and um, sometimes significantly less than that. Hillary? Oh, um, I just, just, sorry, this just, this, that $2 million or which $1.9 million that you're requesting, that's still a mil over a million dollars less than the recommended amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a question for Mike, actually. So you had, and this is probably just a quick one, but you have you had um, indicated that stipends for um, coaching and clubs <coughs> are calculated based on a salary. What about um, coaches and and advisors who are not school employees? How do you calculate the stipends? Are based are based on using a rubric and a formula that that starts with the teacher base, and, uh, and so so teachers get excuse me um, club advisors and athletic coaches will get points based on certain components of a rubric, and those points then um, articulate into a percentage, and and the percentage is is a percentage of the teacher base pay. Okay. So if a teacher whether base you're a teacher pay, or not. whether you're a teacher right. or not, if the teacher base pay is affected, then um, it does affect, you know, st club stipends and coaches stipends and all those things. Okay, thanks. Yep. And some of those points collected are, are calculated are like the size of the club, <coughs> the time, frequency that they need, the level of responsibility that that club advisor or coach would have. Um, so I saw Nick, April, and was there another one there? Um, so my question is, is for Mike as well. Um, when you were talking about the development director position, I couldn't help but be reminded of like a grant coordinator position that we've done at the college before. And so my question for those that are kind of adding up the numbers is do you imagine this position to be to be successful, to be essentially budget neutral and actually generating income so that the money this person would bring in would probably not only cover their own salary and expenses, but actually give a net plus <coughs> to operations of athletics and activities? Yes, thank you for asking that. We've had that in the budget for a number of years. Um, it originally started out where we have a um, income area you know, booster groups, that's well in excess of $300,000 and really not the level of support that's needed for those folks. So we really wanted somebody that would have an eye on that. Um, but also, like you say, look at other areas of um, income that would be stable. And that, that was the thing that we wanted to make sure we made the point is because when we do these programs, um, a, as we've seen with some, and even recently, is we'd want to create income that we could count on year after year after year after year because you don't want to have the income one year and say, we're going to do this program now, and ooh, we didn't get it next year, so we can't do this program now. And so um, I don't think that that's fair to kids. So, um, so, but yes, the ultimate goal would be that person would come on board and cover their own salary at some point, you know, eventually. Maybe not year one. Right. And I think alpine skiing is the perfect example of what Mike's describing, right? So I think you you touched on part of my, one of my questions. I would like to talk about the boosters a little bit. Um, I would like to know how our booster contributions um, compare uh, to other districts in terms of you know, making a over three hundred thousand dollar contribution to our programs every year. Mm -hmm. um, how that compares to other districts, and then also, and I think you, you kind of answered it. Um, you suggested that we look towards moving away from that reliance mm -hmm. on those booster groups, um, and from uh, uh, someone who doesn't have kids in 
sport in organized sports yet. Um, I'm <coughs> curious like, what the advantage or why why you're motivated to say that. Like what the motivation is behind moving away from those three different programs. Mm -hmm. <coughs> A simple answer to your second question is for the stability of the programs. Um, and like Dr. Kukenberger said, the most recent example of that is probably alpine skiing, where the year before I started in Scarborough, the board had sanctioned alpine skiing, but it was sanctioned with the caveat that it would, it would be given zero funding. And so it lasted 10 years, and then everybody decided to, you know, as, as what happens, people move on because their kids move on. And... So now we're in a situation where we didn't have the funding to support that program any longer. Um, it wasn't in the budget, and they, didn't have an, they hadn't done enough fundraising because they kind of disbanded as a, as a group. Um, so really it's a stabilized program because what we saw with that example and many other examples over the years is that, um, you know, it... it we want to be able to either offer the program or not offer the programs. And this is coming from an athletic director, and I'm even saying don't offer it if you can't afford to pay for it sure. because it creates, it's, it's detrimental to kids. We, we offer it one year or for 10 years, and then we can't offer it anymore. And so um, if we can't afford to do it, don't do it. And it's around stabilization. In terms of booster income, probably the same kind of thing as – our success in terms of uh, championships, if you measure it that way, um, it's uncanny. It's unusual to have a booster group, have a, have a collaborative booster group that raises that level of income. Um, usually it's, it's fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, say, a booster group might raise. It's also unusual. Most booster groups in most school systems are one group that raise money for all departments. We'd, I don't feel that that's um, the best thing for Scarborough right now. I think the individual groups is still the best approach. It raises us the most money. And I hate to make it sound that way, but we have <coughs> to position ourselves and position the groups to raise the most money because we need that to support the programs. And um, to do that, individual groups is a much more effective way um, to, to handle that. Um, but it also comes with its challenges. You know, when you have over 20, almost 30 booster groups, that comes with challenges. Um, so we've tried to make some incremental changes to that over the years. Um, some have, have met more resistance than others, but... Um, all in the all in the name of 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 our fiduciary responsibility um, to assure those funds are properly spent, and that we try as best we can to stabilize those funds so that we can count on those um, for for those programs moving forward. Can I add something to that, Jim? Sure. <clears throat> I think that one of the things to remember is that other districts who are raising 50000 instead of 300000 one of the reasons that they can succeed that way is because they have fully funded the essential components of their program. So they're not asking the football boosters to pay for helmets. They're, instead, they're buying swag or a jacket or you know a cool um, tote bag. Well, it's not a tote bag for football, is it? <laughs> What's the word? I Duffel? You know. A cute tote bag. Um, so uh, th I think that's one of the differences that we see here, that, that you know, folks are really pitching in and paying for our programs in this community. Yeah. I, I would just add, too, and I probably sh maybe should have answered your question this way, is that I don't advocate getting rid of booster groups. We're going to always need booster groups. Okay. We're always going to need booster groups. I just don't think booster groups should be paying for essential components of programs. I don't think they should be buying helmets and safety equipment and paying for ice time and those. I don't, I don't think booster groups should be doing those things. And right now they are. Yeah. And I, I think booster groups should be doing things like supporting banquets and, you know, maybe buying warm-up things and, 
you know, those sorts of things. Things that would not be essential for a, for a group to be able to do their activity. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge disservice when we have booster groups funding essential components of the program. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just add to what Mike and Kate said, we also have to keep in mind Title IX obligations. So we have um, both a moral but also a legal obligation to ensure that we're offering um, sports for students who identify male and female equitably. And so if you have one booster group, say like football, that's really robust and can offer a lot um, to that program. But the comparative to that would be field hockey right. um, isn't as robust, then we can get into some serious issues with that as well. So I saw Nick and Amy, Were the, was this a build on to what Mike was just saying before we go to Sarah's question, or? I have separate questions, but if you guys have I have a question on, to build on. The build on, okay, so we'll do Amy, Nick, Hillary, then go to Sarah's question. I really appreciate what Mike is saying about um, boosters should be in place to boost the programs, to enrich the programs. That's their functionality. I, I was wondering if um, there's ever been a document produced that shows the public for each sport and each club what, what they're funding that's essential, that the school should be funding but can't and what they're funding that is enriching. Because I think that that would be very powerful information for the community to see how much these boosters groups support the essential costs of these programs. So I know Mike has created that for, for me. I've seen that, I know it exists, but I don't know if we've published it. So, so, that. And the other thing is with that is that we're I hate to say this, but unfortunately, we're already always discovering new things. Mm -hmm. Like we, I found out just this year that the swim coach was getting a booster person to donate paper for his photocopier when we could have been providing that mm -hmm. for them. But he, they use a lot of paper because of printing out score sheets and stuff. And so we're always discovering new things too. But we do have a document that we created. I mean, I get it would be a fluid document. It would always be changing. But I, I just really feel that it's a powerful story to tell this community and that we could perhaps do a better job of telling that story in terms of how much the community is funding these essential costs for these programs. I have a follow-up question about the, um, the development director position. Um, the, you talked about how it would potentially provide stability um, to some of our programs. And you, you talked about like, like an annual funding source. So I, I first wonder if you could give an example of that. And then I have a worry, perhaps, about a development director. And I, I don't know um, if, I, I, I just worry that a development director might have an unintended consequence in terms of the booster's ability to raise funding for their program. So I wondered if there was a strategy if that position ever came to fruition in terms of not competing uh, within the community to, to raise funding for programs. So what would be an example of a stable funding source that might be an annual source? I can't tell you what an example would be. That's why we <laughs> want a development director <laughs> to help figure that out. But I would guess an annual gift from a large business would probably be an example of that. Um, and very much like many nonprofits do right now. Um, if you think of it in terms of, you know, like United Way type nonprofit organizations and how they go after funding. I think, I think we're already in a situation of competing fundraisers. Um, and so those things are always concerns, which is why I think the development director needs to be so connected to booster groups now to kind of unpack that. Um, and that's why, um, that's why in my proposal anyways, I think it could end up being a district-wide position, but in my proposal, we kept it really connected to booster groups for that reason, um, because I think that um, we need to figure that out. We're already, there is really not a month that goes by that I don't hear from somebody in the community about um, can I just give you money instead of every group coming to ask me? Um, and so we're already doing that. We're already competing. Um, we just have to 
uh, I think a development director that was that that was their hundred percent focus, um, you know, would help with some of that. And maybe looking forward to how can that person work within the full district too. Thank you. I just want to do a time check. We are ahead of schedule, fifteen minutes ahead, but we have gone over the ten minute question time. I just had a follow up to your funding, which is. Um, how much does our pay to play sorry oh how much does our pay to play model offset our funding and um, anyway sorry I, I just wanted to put that out there because it's not something that I am a big fan of but I understand that it probably offsets a lot of the costs I was just wondering how much that was we we like to call them participation fees, oh, right. and um, and uh, Leave it to me. we um, and the participation fees do offset. It's a little over a hundred thousand dollars. Actually, if you look on page three, there's a revenue myself. summary, um, and one of the page lines on the revenue, three, summary, a revenue summary, summary is uh, student activity fees. We've got a budget of 150,000 for this year, 140,000 for for next year, just based on what we're seeing coming in this year. Yeah. And that includes all activities for which we collect a fee. So that's um, high school, middle school, anything Wentworth, that we collect Wentworth a fee clubs. for. Wentworth clubs. Wentworth. Some time, yeah. some of the uh, club activities have been. Uh, uh, they were. Um, Exempted. Exempt from the activity right study. so they, that's part of the policy like the public uh, service type mm -hmm. um, community service type clubs there was always a list of that in school board policy I don't know if it still is but there's a list of those of those groups that have to pay and those groups that were exempt at the time they put the participation fees into action also the waiver option for folks who uh, have yeah. financial challenges and uh, you know that's certainly a very active area that we scrutinize as we collect those fees I should say though that the student activity fees are not dollar for dollar directly spent on athletics and activities it's just a revenue source like every other revenue source for the general fund. So revenue stays on one side of the books and expenditures stay on the other side. But obviously it's closely related to what we're spending on athletics and activities. I think that's really important that for is. Kate to say because a lot of people ask, if, if we bring an X number of dollars in soccer, does that go to soccer? It doesn't. Right. It goes to general fund that helps with the overall offset. The it student fees. Yeah, the fundraising. student fees. But the student fees. Does, does for yeah. booster fundraising. But yeah. not for yeah, right. And actually, as you know, too, the boosters, all some booster clubs also charge a, a <coughs> kind of an activity fee as well. So there are many, there are many booster groups that do that also. Could you give an example of that, Mike? Yeah, like for example, hockey, um, because they used to, in the past, they used to have to raise money for ice time. So we would charge an activity fee, say, of a hundred dollars for a student to participate. And then the boosters might charge an additional $500 booster fee, um, that which helps offset the expenses that a booster group has to cover, because you can't do it. You couldn't do it all in fundraising. For example, in hockey, it used to be really uh, cash cow, so to speak, the bingo that they used to do, and then bingo died, and so, but they still had to raise X number of dollars to pay for ice time and those things. Thankfully, in recent years, we, we've been able to pick up that cost, so they've greatly reduced those booster fees to students. I think they're down to $100 or $125. When, when I first started, they were up, upwards of $600 a kid. Um, so the fees are greatly reduced, but it is an offset to help boosters with fundraising because, like Amy said, you're, you're competing all the time for fundraising, and so... Um, they just can't raise the money that they they require to have every year, and so there is a, a lot of times an additional activity fee, if you will, a booster fee. Of course, we don't make any student pay any fee that can't afford to. They're never denied an opportunity to participate because of that. The unfortunate side is: are people asking for help, or are they just opting not to participate because of the money, which is what? we worry about. Um, 
but certainly anybody that's come and asked has never been denied an opportunity to participate because of money. Mm -hmm. Mike, can you pass it to Sarah? Thanks. So, Mike, related to that, there's $15,000 line item in the budget for participation fees. So what does that cover? Is that's actually uh, fees that the department pays to other organizations, so like belonging to um, SMAA, and it's yeah, your dues and fees line. Okay. Yeah, why don't you give it back to me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we have a line item in clubs for middle school and high school and athletics that is participation fees or dues and fees, and those things pay for like um, the royalties for the Oak Hill Players production, um, speech and debate dues to be in that organization, one act play royalties, the jazz band, it also pays. Um, there's a fee to be in the SMAA for athletics. Mm -hmm. There's an MPA fee to be a member of the MPA um, for athletics. Um, so participation fees are not, um, they're not the participation fee that the kids pay. Participation fees in the line items are um, cost to be associated with the different organizations that we're associated with. Um, and then there's other fees too that we, no that we normally have. There might be, actually this is in a different line now, but it used to be in participation fees, like we have to pay a fee f to have family ID, for example, as a registration program. Um, that's in a different software line now, but um, that would be that would be examples of that. Okay, that makes sense. I have another question. Um, there's a ninety-five thousand dollar line item for contracted bus drivers, and that's in addition to what we pay just normal mm -hmm. wages. Yeah. Is it fair to assume that if we had a full staff in the bus drivers, that that ninety-five thousand dollar amount would go down, or are they exclusive to one another? Um, I don't. I don't. I don't know in today's world if we would still have to have some money for contracted buses. But yes, in theory, that number would go away if we were fully staffed and had. To, when I first started in Scarborough, we had we had a sub spares list. We had. I mean, it was just we could get a bus whenever we wanted one, yeah. and it was a really. I think. I think when you get to the transportation section. Um, Mr. Sizemore will talk maybe a little bit about that, but it, um, yes, if we were if we were where we were when I first started in Scarborough, we would probably not need that money. As a matter of fact, that was a new line item. Um, it was a new line item last year, and then a new line item, you know, and then we kept it for this year, knowing that we likely would be in the same situation. But originally, we had plenty of drivers. We even had a spare list that only drove for after school activity. It was really, we had a robust um, department there. And that, that would take care of that. That was during the recession when everyone was looking for a job. Right. I just one more question, suggestion, then we'll take you off the hot seat. Um, in the capital improvement, budget mm -hmm. for athletics there is a cost associated for updating the scoreboards and I think adding um, a clock shot, shot clock um, have you guys similar related to the funding question as well do you guys ever reach out to alumni for donations and the reason I ask that is because my our class actually funded one of the existing scoreboards um, and I don't think since then we've ever had uh, requests from schools for any sort of alumni donation, so it could be an alternative funding source if you guys don't already do that. We uh, we would love to do that. We'd love to have a robust alumni group. We haven't had a mechanism in my time here that's done that, and the funds that have been left over in the account have not been used to go toward <coughs> those types of things. Um, and so that would be that would be a deeper discussion down the road. One of the things that we want to do with that scoreboard money is we want to smartly invest it so that it can also generate revenue. One of the things that we're looking at, and it may seem elaborate, but one of the things we're looking at with the scoreboard is a digital scoreboard that we could also run advertising on and sell advertising to create a di an additional revenue source, which I feel that would be a stable revenue source. You could count on people buying ads for that every year. And um, that would be something that a development director, for example, would help us with. So um, um, 
the thought was with the shot clock thing is that there was talk around um, uh, of moving to a shot clock in in Maine. Um, so that's why we needed to have those, those monies available. If it's not that, we'd really like to look at how can we invest that money in score clock still, not take it out of that, but how can we maybe smartly invest that that would also generate revenue. <coughs> Joanne has been working on establishing an alumni network, so I think this is a relevant time for her to kind of fill you in on where that is, and then we'll go to Alicia. Okay. For the last couple of years, we've been trying to work with the high school in regards to starting an alumni list, mm -hmm. um, because at this point, we don't have one. And um, I'm happy to say that this year, we have a mechanism um, through Naviance where all of our seniors are going to um, be asked to enter their personal email so that we can get in contact with them next year and see how they're doing, how, where, you know, their um, goals, if they're still on track of what they, um, when they left our high school. And also, it will give us the opportunity to start creating that list for, for network for the uh, future. And also part of the rebranding we did over the past two years with our mission and our vision and our values um, and our goals is to really begin to establish that, that broader purpose that alumni can connect to and stay connected to. Um, and that's also the work that the athletics department has done around really branding our logos. Um, and we're trying to also build more community support with our hashtag Red Storm Pride initiative and things like that. So it all comes together and it really is a marketing plan, which is not something that public schools have had to have in the past, but we're really in a place, particularly as a minimum receiver community, where we have to be thinking about those creative funding sources. So that is certainly part of the long-term vision. This question is for Mike. We we heard from community members that they had an interest in an alpine ski team. And I know that that was one of your unmet needs. Did you explore adding that to your budget and determine what the results would be if, if it was included in this year's budget? So um, alpine skiing was definitely one of Mike's priorities. And if you... Um, I don't know, does everybody have this document here where you see this is the leadership council has an opportunity to fill out what's called an investment proposal and every single department head and principal um, every single person in this room can create an investment proposal so certainly Mike did that for Alpine skiing knowing that this was a community ask and then what we do is we go through a multi-phase process of assessing the priority of each proposal um, and so department by department, we spend several hours, each department presents their proposals and they rank them high, medium, and low priority. Um, and then we look at it together as a K-12 system and we say, okay, Al alpine skiing I think was a medium or was a high priority for Mike. And then we look at it comparative to, you know, having enough teachers to support our increasing enrollment needs. Is alpine skiing a higher priority or a lower priority? Um, and so then what we do as a leadership council is rank those priorities uh, with that K-12 perspective in mind. And again, going back to what's our mission? Why do we exist? What's our vision? Who are we trying to become? <coughs> and you'll see, unfortunately, there are several items, um, you know, upwards over a million dollars that don't even make it in the initial priority list. Um, so there's lots of refinement that happens in that December, January, February timeframe that Kate showed you in the very beginning. Um, and it's disappointing for our principals. It's disappointing for our directors. It, they're always difficult conversations because when you're looking at your department, you know, it, it may be a really high priority, but then when you put it in the context of our whole system, um, sometimes it falls below the line, um, which is the case with Alpine skiing. This, uh, this question it could be for either one of you, I guess. It's about the community service interplay with our schools and how that works in terms of the responsibility for the maintenance and also for the assignment of the facilities and and I don't fully understand that I was wondering if they're good I'll start Mike, I'll start, Mike you finish the simple division between community services and our facilities department is that we manage all the inside facilities they manage all the outside facilities, so fields uh, are all theirs, uh, and they mow them and line them and 
prepare them for the games and so forth. Likewise, internally, we take care of all the inside space, gyms and cafeteria, auditorium, so forth. Um, there is, so, so they do pay a rental fee for their child care in the facilities. And Kate has a number, I, I forget what it is, but it's an annual amount that they pay for each school they use. Um, that's the only income they provide to us. Um, and when it comes to scheduling the facilities, the person who actually runs the scheduling programs called Rec Track um, actually is a community services employee, and that person schedules everything for both inside and outside facilities. So if you have a request to use the cafeteria, the community services person is the schedule keeper, but they're not the authorizer. That authorization goes through the various departments for whatever space is requested. Mike can probably speak more about his interaction with them for his outdoor facilities. Let me first say selfishly that, and I think for all the school leaders, the unmet needs would be something that we'd all want to have if we could. But in the big scheme of things, like I mentioned, there's just other priorities in the district. Um, in terms of the relationship, we're very fortunate to have had a good, long-standing relationship with community services. And like Todd said, um, they're responsible for the outdoor things. We're responsible for the indoor things. But there is some overlap. From time to time, we do... Um, we will support investments outdoors and indoors because it benefits our programs. We're probably the largest user of those facilities. Um, and so we would benefit from that. For example, when we, rep <coughs> when we did the backstop fencing on baseball and softball, that was a CIP request of ours um, to do that work. And also a Title IX related issue. Um, and so, um, so we'll do things like that. Boosters will make investments in the facility as well. Um, probably the most recent is the bullpen mounds for baseball um, and the batting cages for softball, the new batting cages. Those were a collaboration between booster support and community services. Um, we, like Todd said, all the scheduling is done through community services, so we actually have to submit our schedules to community services to book the use of the facilities. We're a priority one user, so there's, there's levels. It's priority one, priority two, priority three. The school is a priority one user, and so we can bump other things for our stuff. So if I have a game that's canceled on one day because of weather and I have to schedule it to the next day, I can bump whoever is scheduled. That causes some anxiety in the community with youth programs and things, but um, it's, it's, it is a good system. Um, it, it, it has its roadblocks sometimes and challenges, but overall it's a, it's a good relationship and a good system. Okay, so do you want to add anything to that? Or? Well, I would agree with Mike that um, we do have a good relationship with community service, and, you know, they have... Um, priorities with uh, the programs that they're running and we have our programs so it's always a challenge to find that balance so that both programs can be successful I would also add that we were asked to sort of do a comparison of services we provide for community services and they were asked the same question vice versa and when I did a quick scan of the rec track system um, community services, community group use of school facilities, um, inclusive of their child care, was over 17,000 hours in a year. So they're a heavy, heavy user of our facilities, just like we are a heavy, heavy user of the fields outside. And I would, I would like to think it's a symbiotic relationship that just it, it works over, because it has over the years. Okay, we're going to move on to the next section. If you continue. Okay, the next, uh, we're going to start with uh, health services, which is on page 50 to 52. Um, I want to first begin that uh, we have an amazing staff, uh, five nurses, one LPN, and one medical assistant that um, take care of close to 3,000 kids every day and do an amazing job at that. Um, over the years, uh, things, as things have grown in the medical field and more things have come into school. Um, when I read their 
scheduled medication administration of 4,490 um, that they have given out since the beginning of the year. That's a lot of uh, medications, and we need those nurses uh, to be in touch with the students and the families around that. During the last couple of years, we've been trying to um, build upon flu clinics. It started <coughs> off, you know, first about four years ago, and now I have to say we have over 345 students this year who participated and 158 staff, which is um, really good. Um, as you can see, since the beginning of the year, 13,100 clinic visits have happened in our schools. And um, there's a lot of kids who, you know, might not have a little headache or they might come down, say, I'm not feeling well. And they have uh, a person who is uh, sympathetic to them, helps them out. And usually a lot of times it's, you know, you're going to be much better. Go back to class and we'll see how you feel in about two hours and let me know. And they just need that comforting voice um, when they get to the clinic. The suicide awareness training, um, we this year decided um, with our social workers in the district to uh, do this training one year earlier. It's supposed to be done every five years, and we decided this year to really look at that. And um, so we have trained over 600 people. That's all of our staff, and we opened it up to community service to their before and after care workers. Um, we did um, the IT department. We did central office. We included people um, upstairs. And so we're pretty proud that we were able to share this information, resources and so forth with over 600 people in Scarborough. One of the things that has happened also is that um, we have been working with the uh, police department and um, uh, Chief Moulton was able to secure Narcan for all of our clinics uh, this year. And uh, we just felt that that was, the nurses felt very strongly that that would be just another preventive uh, measure to have in our schools. And not so much just for our students. Right. But as, as we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the classes that we do in our schools. It could be an adult, it could be a parent, it could be someone right. who's just attending a community. Thank you. Um, so we do have some challenges. Uh, making uh, the community aware of new immunization laws. Um, that's always a, a challenge to get the word out, make sure they understand. Um, and, but the nurses work very hard in calling parents and trying to have those conversations with them. Uh, medical marijuana, um, you know, was a, um, is something that we now do in our schools and how it's administered with a parent or a guardian. Um, our nurses do not administer medical marijuana <coughs> to the students. And the state has uh, a new requirement with uh, sexual abuse prevention and response. And we have sent um, our school nurses and uh, some of our social workers uh, to the training and will be helping us develop a program for our schools. I would say that if you get a chance, please read uh, 50 to 52 to get a real scope of what our school nurses are being asked to do um, for our students. I would agree 100%. It's eye-opening and, yeah, remarkable. So since I have the historian here, I can tell you in 1992, I had one student who needed to get a med <coughs> to school, and we had no procedures, no policies, nothing. And the school nurse who covered K through 8 and I sat down and tried to figure out how are we going to do this one med every day at noon for this one student. And now I go and I look at the med boxes in each school and it's just a different world. Yeah, a different world. You know? but. All right, the next section is on adult ed. And adult ed has... Um, and for our um, over the years, our part-time director has really taken the CNA program and has built that program. 
Last year we had close to it, 40 people who were able to get a CNA um, certificate and are working in the different areas. We also have a medication aid, <coughs> and again, that is um, people getting jobs as soon as they finish the program. <coughs> One of the things that we had looked at was the English language learners, and um, we had a few that were coming to Scarborough, but um, <coughs> we worked with Portland, who had an overflow and weren't able to cover all of those, and so we partnered with Portland and a lot of the uh, learners come here to Scarborough to uh, the day and evening classes that are being offered. Uh, college and career counseling is offered to the adults with career with an online career assessment, helping them get to um, a community college, helping them to see if they, um, what their interest is in pursuing uh, more education, but we have um, that service available to them. We offer credit recovery for some students and adult high school diplomas. Um, we've seen less students coming for a high school diploma, which is a good thing because a lot of them have obtained a high school diploma, and so because there's been a real emphasis on completing high school. But we still have some adults who want to come back because they didn't get their high school diploma and realize how important it is. And we have enrichment classes that we also offer um, with 100 different classes. Those are um, doing okay, but a lot of times um, we don't have the enrollment on the enrichment classes. One of the things that we looked at this year, but I don't think we're going to be able to do it, was to pa uh, partner with South Portland. Um, we're still working to see if that would be a, a possibility someday, but at this point, it um, doesn't look like it's going to be a possibility for next year. And then transportation, which is a hot topic, you all know. <laughs> and um, we're going backwards, Joanne. I know. I should have. It's on page 70. Transportation yeah. is on page 70. So we all need to remember how big Scarborough is, okay? It's 54 square miles, and our buses are doing 450,000 miles a year, traveling around, um, which Sarah had 25,000 miles, which is a lot, okay? Um, and we have an excellent rapport with the town mechanics. Um, the town does all of our service um, on our bus fleet, and they are prompt, excellent um, and very responsive if a bus breaks down. Um, our two-tier bus system this year has provided uh, K2 with on-time arrival in the past. Um, K2 was starting school at 9, sometimes 9.05, 9.10, but this year um, the schools have been starting at 8.50 like they were supposed to for many years. But our busing could not get there. We now have, uh, we have training for new drivers um, who need to have a CDL license. And um, this year, one of our trainers went to be a certified state trainer um, and completed the program for that. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges is getting people <coughs> in for an interview who want to be a bus driver. And then sometimes it takes five or six months before they can become a bus driver. So, we might interview them in November, but they're not going to come on board and probably to March or April. They need to get their, first their permit done, and that is based on all classroom work that we now do in the department, and hopefully they can go take the written test so they can now start the driving part of it. But it does take a while, so if you hire somebody, it's a four- to five-month process before, and that's if they pass their written test and their license. So. And if, and if they don't, which we say, don't worry about it, come on back, we'll still help you and, um, and, and work with them. We also send one of our trainers to the driving test with, our, with a bus driver to ha help them. And also we bring the bus that they've been used to driving for the driving test to try to uh, ease their anxiety with it. Um, an amazing staff at the and um, bus drivers is that they are always looking for uh, caring projects to do. And for the last couple of years, 
they've uh, adopted a family at the holidays, they contribute to the backpack program, they collect food. Um, so I have to say, they're really in tune to the needs of kids. And um, our bus drivers have been trained in the suicide awareness, along with everybody else. And um, we've had, I think, two instances where a bus driver has contacted the school because a student made a comment and started the ball rolling for us. So they're very in tune to the students that they are driving. One of the things that the, this budget does allow, and we started it this year because Sarah was driving a lot, was to try to find some office staff um, to help out and support for the transportation. And um, the feedback from parents, from the leadership council, was that this is really needed. It was so helpful when you called between 11.30 and 4.30, and there was a person there who could answer the phone. So we, um, bec that became one of our top priorities in the transportation, was to make sure that we had office support because it was really needed um, for people. And the challenge is still finding and hiring qualified drivers. I mean, we, we keep on interviewing and um, trying to find um, people, and so we'll continue with that. So at the top of your head, you have the current staff members. Um, we have, I think, 19 bus drivers now. I think we've over the, this year had uh, hired two, and um, we have six aides. We do a lot of transportation in vans for two different schools, but um, <coughs> We have 19 drivers at this time. We're looking for probably two or three more. And when Mike was talking about the after school, you know, 2.30, uh, an athletic team needs to go out. If we had spares, that's what we really need is a spare because we could assign them to the 2.30 slot, which would not interfere with our bus routes. Um, and so we really need spares to do that work at 2.30, and we're trying to find them, people who could be a spare. All right. Well, yeah, I can a spare bus driver be like, can you say I can only work for in the afternoon? Yeah. Oh. Joanne, could you, to that question, um, could you explain how bus drivers, um, how they get assigned here? Oh, okay. So, um, our bus drivers, the 19 that we have, uh, their field trips are posted on a Friday, uh, excuse me, by Wednesday, I'm pretty sure, not the exact day. But like on Friday, they are assigned to what trip, a field trip. And those field trips happen during the middle of the day, okay? Um, but spares would not be part of that because they are, we call them and say, oh, we have, a, we have an athletic trip that goes out at 2.30, you know, and can you help us out? And we try to do it that way. But it has to be bid on, right? It has to be bid on. For the middle of the day, there's a whole procedure of, <laughs> no, you know, there's a whole procedure on um, who gets the job and how it's ro and how it's done and so forth. And um, so that's a little different than the stairs. Thank you. Coming around to Alicia. Joanne, I have two questions for you. One is, um, under the transportation costs, there's what I'm assuming is just a portion of community services transportation. Um, that's done in the summer. Are you talking about? It says community services, transportation, wages, overtime. Right. Maybe. In the summertime, um, community services contracts with some of our bus drivers to do their uh, in their summer programming. Okay. Okay. They go to different um, field trips. And, and then my second question. Hold on one second. I think Kate wants to add to that. <laughs> Should we buy a new microphone? <laughs> <laughs> one, one for everybody. Is that um, magic? I'm not sure which line that goes under. So I just wanted to mention that also there's this detailed revenue page on page three. One of the lines in there is uh, community services daycare, which Todd re referenced earlier, and another line is community services transportation. So what it's, it's designed to be a wash. Uh, we provide them with the services, we pay our drivers, so we need an expenditure line in our budget, and then we give them a bill and they reimburse us on the revenue side. Thank you. Thank you. 
my other question was, I, I heard at one of the meetings I attended that there's an opportunity for current students to participate in credit recovery programs through adult ed. Are the, is the other programming available to current students as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. And is that at a cost or is that? Nope. Okay. No cost. Um, and our guidance counselors at the high school do know about that and work with the students and, and literally go to the adult ed office and introduce them and get them started. Um, Joanne, can you talk about whether, we've heard a lot about the, the um, switch this year to doing a two-tier bus system as opposed, so like in years past, there have been three separate bus routes. This year, there's two separate bus routes. Is that your question? Stop. Is there an associated increase or decrease in cost for running a two-tier system versus a three-tier system? I would say probably um, with two, you're not going out back and forth, right. and the buses are out there only two, two times instead of three. So there has to be uh, a cost uh, associated with a three-tier system. So it's a, you're saying it's an increase? No, I'm saying it's a decrease with two. It's a decrease in right. terms of fuel usage, okay. but it's using the same amount of drivers. Okay. Right. So, right. yeah, fuel and fuel and vehicle maintenance, you would right. see a little bit of a reduction. So that, okay, well, I have two questions. Um, but since we're talking about buses, that was one of my questions. Was I had thought when we moved from a two from a three tier system back to a two tier, or not back, but to a two tier system, we had actually increased the number of daily routes or increase the, the number of drivers that we needed. No. And so my question was, would moving back to a three-tier system alleviate the need to contract? But you're saying we would need the same number of drivers. Same number. Okay. Um, my second question has nothing to do with bus drivers. Um, I know we have a consulting physician. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the role that he plays in the district and what impact that has on the budget? Well, this is our first, uh, we have a new uh, physician, and he has um, been very helpful in that um, the nurses do call him for um, his opinion, uh, <coughs> advice on, especially with the immunization laws that came about. He also has come out, I would say, at least three or four times to the health staff meetings and, and has met with them. So I think it's been um, very um, helpful to the nurses in that, um, having a resource like that. And Kate, where can we find? What's the cost? What's the cost? Is yes. that Thank you. About five thousand, and it's yeah. in the school uh, school nurses health services budget. It's under contracted services under health services. Thank you. Um, a piece of that budget line is their software for um, case management, and another piece is that um, consulting physician. The question was, are we required to have a school physician? The answer to that is yes. yes. Um, the school physician also, not only does he help with policy implementation, also helps with policy development, trainings, and can write scripts. So s we might need scripts for, for say, example, EpiPens or some general medications that we aspirin, sunscreen, just to have on hand, and those all require scripts that the school physician can provide. Is that a question? One of the, uh, I just want to point out one of the best investments was um, using health, health office and that has um, put, has put everything online, it tracks things, um, it's just been very beneficial and uh, a support for parents too. When a student's medication is wearing, uh, is uh, running out, an email goes out saying your <coughs> child's medication needs to be updated. Mm -hmm. Prior to using this online platform, um, our, our health, our nurses were actually keeping binders with all of this information in them. So you know, that obviously, there's a huge increase in efficiency and effectiveness whenever we can, you know, digitize things and make them accessible from any any point at any time, really. But it took a lot of training and a lot of work on the part of the nurses to get all of those handwritten documents into that system. And I think we're we're ready. Thank no, you. Oh yeah, they're it's right. all in there now. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the next thing on our agenda is a little break. Um, and because we 
are a little bit, we just need to adjust our schedule a little bit here. Why don't we come back together um, in 10 minutes? So I will adjust this slide to say it's 10.52 right now. We'll say 11.02, come back together. And again, feel free to help yourself, use the restroom, help yourself to snacks, and connect with two more people who you haven't yet connected with today.
two minute warning. We have about two minutes left of break. He'll do it. Okay, when we come back together, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Joanne. She'll walk you through school nutrition um, as another department she directly oversees. And then I'll talk a little bit about central office. And Kate will bring us home with some CIP and equipment. Yes. Do, I, do I do like a soft shoe with that? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's so luxurious. Okay, so, uh, school nutrition. So I'd have to say during the last three years, this is the one department that has probably seen an enormous amount of change in um, how things are done as a department. Um, as you know, we have a shared service with Cape Elizabeth for the last three years, and Peter Esposito has done a fabulous job of changing the menus, uh, providing the staff with uh, different trainings, in regards to how you prepare food and so forth. He has reached out to local farms in this area and has a very healthy relationship with them, bringing uh, local farms into the schools. He's even used the food produced with, at the Wentworth Gardens in uh, the Wentworth cafeteria. So kids um, have, last, I think last fall they had um, and different potatoes and carrots and so forth, all roasted vegetables. Um, and so he's really done a superb job integrating the food service department to our schools. Um, one of the things that's always difficult has been um, what happens with the budget. At the end, we always need to help out food service and, and so forth. But last year, um, we uh, put more money into the budget to help uh, with that deficit uh, from the general fund. So many other outreach programs that he's done is now he has a catering menu and he's reached out to boosters. I know public safety had an event and he was the caterer for it. So using um, uh, different skills and also um, our staff being involved with that, has also produced, I would have to say, more self-esteem in their program and what they're doing, and they're proud of it. Um, I know that when you walk into some of the schools, they're always asking, what's the soup for the day? Or he's made, if he's having something, really a soup that everyone loves. It's like a buzz in the school mm -hmm. that this is what's happening. 
He's also been part and very uh, a big part of the community Thanksgiving Day right from the beginning. He um, does all the cooking, um, he volunteers his time, he also has some of his family members here helping with the community Thanksgiving Day and it has been a real success. This year he also did a Valentine's Day dance and um, provided the uh, food for that. Um, the backpack program um, is housed at Wentworth and, um, like I said, weekly support, um, vacations. Some kids are even getting <coughs> daily support now also. And so, um, and that happens in all of our schools and, and they really want to make sure that kids are being supported. Um, I just wanted to add that we're in development for a vocational phone area. Uh, we're also in development for next year for a vocational, vocational culinary arts program um, at our high school, piloting that. Uh, so he's been a great contributor. Great. And I think some of the board members went to Cape Elizabeth to see the high school program there. Yep. Leanne. Okay. And Sarah, and um, you know, he's pretty proud of what he's done over there with that program and, and hopes to bring something similar to Scarborough High School with it. Um, all of the stuff you had today, the baked goods, came from our school uh, nutrition program, so um, very tasty, and we always like them. <laughs> and uh, we have about 2,200 meals, breakfast and lunch per day, that they are producing, and that's a lot of meals. Um, for, uh, for a staff that has six cooks and bakers and 14 cafeteria workers. So um, what they do for all of our kids in the six schools is uh, really good. And uh, any questions? No. Oh, no. <laughs> um, you will also have the opportunity to have a collaborative presentation from Peter, who is our food service director, um, and his student intern that he has from Scarborough High School this year at our second April meeting. Um, I believe they're scheduled to come. So looking at central office, I'll talk a little bit about our district-wide focus this year, and this is found in your budget book on pages 76 through 78. Um, some of the things that are district-wide projects, um, of course, engaging the school leadership and exploring the data-wise improvement process, which um, part of the data-wise improvement process is making the most out of our meetings, and so that's the agenda format that you see us using. Um, again, that's we're trying to ensure that every meeting folks come to, um, it's a benefit to them and that they're leaving saying, that was worth my time. Um, and making them learning events, um, learning opportunities as well. This is also about connects back to our um, our comprehensive needs assessment and our improvement plan that's outlined in the CNA, um, the comprehensive needs assessment. This is our district goal number one: is to create this district-wide improvement process. And there's lots of connections, as you've heard today, um, when we think about the improvements um, that we've made in terms of our start times and our transportation. We're using this data-wise improvement process to measure and assess the success of that and to make determinations about what might need to be iterated. Um, Monique talked about the data analytics piece. Really, it's um, become very obvious to us that we have lots of staff who are ready to have um, to be analyzing more student data to drive their teaching and learning in their classrooms, but they need access, and so that's a part of this. So it really has multiple tenants that stretch throughout our organization, and what we're trying to do is make sure that we're not falling into the trap that often happens in public education, where um, we often have solution-itis, or you'll hear teachers say things like, oh, here we go, here it comes again, like you know, the pendulum swings, you know, some of these things you hear educators say all the time. Um, we're trying to eliminate that or reduce that by saying we're not going to just change things because there's something new or something's packaged in a different way. We're actually shifting our mindset from a change mindset to an improvement mindset. Um, so I like to say that change is easy, even though most people say change is hard. I think you can change something um, pretty uh, pretty easily, but truly improving it takes conscious effort and intentionality. And so that's what we've been working on, and it permeates everything that we do. Um, the second piece is really working towards increasing opportunities for teacher voice and input. Um, this last summer, you all know that we had a, a K-12 professional development redesign team that looked at how are we using 
the guaranteed professional development time that we currently have. Um, and then we specifically honed into looking at the, the late start Wednesdays and how that time is being used um, and incorporated a lot of teacher voice into that. And we're um, implementing that plan currently. We've already had one check-in with a plan to go back out to staff to have that mid-year check-in with them again um, in the next couple of weeks to see how they're finding it. One of the things we've learned is that it's not enough time. Um, so we've also talked about how do we take that 80 minutes or so that we have on those late start Wednesdays and is there an opportunity to increase that time so they can have a longer work period to hone in on that district goal number two and one, but two also, which is that organizing themselves around collaboration or in order to collaborate. Um, we also, Kate and I, as you know, went out into the schools in December to hear directly from staff about their needs in terms of this FY20 budget. And you'll hear from principals tomorrow all of the different ways that we've been able to really respond to what we were hearing from our teachers. Um, one of the things, you know, kind of what I think you heard Todd and, and both Mike say um, is that folks have gotten so used to this um, tight budget kind of feeling that they, what we heard was teachers just aren't even asking for things in a lot of, a lot of ways. So one of the things we looked at was, you know, are we, is there, um, is there equity across the districts in terms of the supplies and resources that teachers have access to? Um, but again, hearing that voice and then showing um, some specific responses to that. The third thing listed here is about enhancing communication and community outreach via multiple platforms. And so this afternoon, we will have our um, internal Scarborough Public Schools key communicators meeting <coughs> um, every couple of weeks on Tuesday afternoons. And we've really been trying to amplify the use of social media in a positive way to tell our story better. Um, and we've been testing that for the last couple of months and we're getting ready to make a community announcement about that um, as we finalize sort of what that will look like moving forward. But we've recently um, started an Instagram account. Um, we've had a Twitter account, but it was kind of dormant for a number of years. So we are using that. And then all of that is feeding into our Facebook page. So really just trying to show everyday evidence of the amazing teaching and learning that's happening in our schools. Uh, the fourth thing is exploring new and continued opportunities for operating efficiencies. This is pretty much our mantra all day, every day. We're constantly looking at how can we do more with less or how can we do um, things better with what we have, um, looking at our resources, whether it be uh, the types of lights that are in the schools um, to you know, the way that we're utilizing personnel. So always, always looking for operating efficiencies across the district. Um, that also, or, and then the last thing is updating our long-range facilities plan, which several of you know very intimately, the work that needs to be done with that. Um, we did receive our rating cycle results in June of 2018. Um, not surprising <coughs> to anyone, we learned that we did not, you know, meet the a threshold that was even reasonable to expect funding in the near future. But this is something that we have to continue to apply for because what it does do is it holds our schools harmless, which means that all of the facility needs that we have now um, it are frozen, basically. So if Todd goes and replaces boilers or heat pumps or makes improvements or increases efficiencies in our schools, um, it doesn't change our rating cycle at, um, results. And that's really important because as other schools either fund projects locally or receive funding through the state, we could move up the list over the next decade or so um, if we aren't coming up with local solutions ourselves. Um, ideally, uh, we would be able to address these our needs on the local level, but we know that there's lots of complexity to that. So we're trying to just make sure that we have these so, sort of parallel opportunities um, constantly in motion as we as we work to assess and address um, the multiple facility challenges that we have related to enrollment changes. Um, so you remember from the study in January, we know we have this bubble, K2 is feeling it in real time right now, um, but then those students are going to move on into Wentworth, um, the middle school, and then eventually the high school. So um, our overall enrollment number may not seem like it's increasing, but where the where the bubble is, is what is causing the impact. And so we'll need to be really agile and flexible as we support students um, during those times, while also understanding that, um, I think you could talk to pretty much any teacher in our district from kindergarten through 12th grade, and they would tell you that the needs of the students are changing. 
um, our students are coming in with more and more complex needs, which means that we have to respond um, in a variety of ways. It's the professional development piece that Monique talked about earlier and making sure that they have the essential <coughs> knowledge and skills they need to meet students where they are. Um, but it's also making sure that we have the right equipment if there's specialized equipment, um, making sure we have the right therapies available if there's um, special therapeutic needs that need to be addressed, which then, of course, means <coughs> space. How we use our space um, will look really different as we work to really um, customize public education for our students here in Scarborough. So in this budget, with all that being said, that's sort of like a big general overview. There's obviously thousands of other things going on. Um, but in this budget, we have um, requested a 1.0 FTE for a human resource specialist. I think um, any uh, organizational leader, whether it be in a public school or in a business, would tell you that human resources are your most valuable resources. Here in Scarborough, we have over 500 employees. Um, and I think most people in our community be, would be shocked to know that we don't have an HR department. Um, we don't have any one person designated to supporting our most valuable resources, our people. It's sort of a shared service across multiple um, central office administrators with Kate being the key person who really coaches folks um, when it comes to benefits and retirement and leaves and things like that. Joanne also um, carries a big portion of that. I, of course, also have a piece in that and so does Monique. Um, and so we're kind of sharing this service across, um, across central office. And I, Allison and Chris, of course, with the special education department. Um, but we don't have that centralized person who's really making sure that we are being as efficient as and effective as we can be in supporting our people. And um, Kate has developed a really robust proposal, which I know that the Finance Committee has seen, and I believe she also has printed copies today, that I would encourage you to read. Because if, it, if, if we keep in mind that 76% of our budget um, goes towards supporting our staff in terms of salaries and benefits, um, then we should also protect that investment and support that investment by having an HR person, um, like any other organization our size would. In fact, they'd have a whole department. Um, and so that's one of the things that we are asking for in this budget, and really we, we put it in our proposal um, knowing that it probably won't make it to the second round um, or to the second reading, but really so we can start this conversation and engage the community in understanding how lean the central office administration team really is um, in, the, in the type of work that we do. Uh, the other aspect of this budget, it really allows us to maintain the required and appropriate district-wide supports um, that have been able to help us realize or work towards realizing that long-range vision for continuous improvement. Um, and there's lots of evidence of that work in your exhibits, but the <coughs> real evidence is the stuff that we're posting on social media, the everyday teaching and learning that's happening. It's really the job of central office to clear the way for our teachers to be fully engaged and present with our students. Um, and so that's the work that we do, thinking strategically about how we organize ourselves and others in order to make that possible. Two unmet needs that I would highlight. Um, Joanne and I continue to share an administrative assistant. I think that's really unique for a district of our size, um, for the superintendent and assistant superintendent to not have their own supports. Um, we've been um, getting by with the fact that we have all of these sort of like what I like to call magical unicorns that exist in our district, which are people who can have very um, unique skill sets and are able to do um, several different things under one sort of generalized job title, and Kelly Johnson would be one of those people. Kate would be one of those people. Any administrator sitting in this room would be one of those people. Um, but then Monique also shares her administrative assistant in supporting Joanne. So again, we're kind of splitting the work and um, sharing it among several people across the central office. Uh, that's something that I would highly recommend you invest in in the future in order to increase communication, increase effectiveness, um, and better support your executive leadership team. Um, the other piece of, that we've talked a lot about, and I think that even the community in some of their forums has talked about the need for the town to have some sort of communication specialist. 
Um, earlier, I mentioned our mission, vision, and values in the context of sort of a marketing plan. Um, and that's really what public education has become. We really have to sell the work that we do in order to get the taxpayer support so that we have the resources to do the job that we're, that we're charged with. Um, and so someone who is specifically trained in um, communicating what we do and why we do it, I think would bring a lot of value not only to the school department but also to the town of Scarborough as a whole. So not in the budget this year, but again, want to put it out there um, to start the conversation and have us thinking about <coughs> how do these investments, although they cost money up front, save us money in the long run. Thanks, Julie. So um, the HR specialist position is such a last minute move of the line of what's in the budget that I'm passing around a budget page <laughs> Uh, page 78 in your budget book says that it's an unmet need. And through the comments and uh, conversations that we've had with the leadership team and the school board finance committee, we decided to move the line in our request for investments down by one item. And uh, so now it's, it's in the proposal. Um, and um, I'm wearing my sparkly purple unicorn socks that Julie gave me. I'll have to take my sneakers off so you can see them. Um, to illustrate the way that our leadership team has been pulling together and doing all kinds of remarkable things. Non-stop sparkle. <laughs> so sneaker off, sock out. No one can really see this, can they? I'll have to get up and walk. I can see it. It's special. <laughs> so these are now my lucky budget socks. Um, so I do have those new pages coming around, and I have a couple of handouts that I mentioned that um, I think we'll just lay them out so people can pick them up maybe at the end of the second day. Um, I'm tasked with one more slide for you, which is capital projects. And um, you've heard a lot about the technology and the facilities piece of this from uh, Michelle and from Todd. And uh, the capital improvement projects at the very back of the budget binder, I think I referred to it earlier, is kind of a detailed worksheet. I call it the stripey worksheet, uh, which is um, descriptive of all the different uh, capital projects that we have in our budget. And uh, we don't have the same sort of summary of capital projects that we have um, in the front of the book for the operating budget because it has to go together with the town's capital projects, and um, it's a little bit different method of trying to figure out what's tax dollars and what's bonded and what's leased. There are, there are a number of different um, financing options for capital projects. The capital budget also is not part of the school referendum. The school referendum that our voters will come out for in June only covers the K-12 operating budget. Uh, so school nutrition, adult education, and capital budgets aren't included in that process. So the, the budget process that we'll go through for those will be um, the usual school board, first reading, second reading, um, deliberations by the school board finance committee, deliberations by the town finance committee, and uh, town council will actually be the folks who authorize that final budget uh, at the end of the day. My bullets here are basically telling you why things are in capital budgets. We use the term CIP all the time, which stands for Capital Improvement Projects. Um, and typically what we try to do is have um, projects in the capital budget be um, either one-time large investments or um, uh, refitting infrastructure, uh, changing over in, in large size projects. The other piece in uh, facilities is ongoing, again, larger projects like replacing roofs, um, replacing building envelope, as, as we call it, which is windows and doors. Um, if you look at pages 79 through 84, you've got a narrative in the budget book that describes each one of the projects. And I think that's kind of helpful because it explains, um, particularly in the facilities area, it talks about the useful life of uh, uh, um, different components of HVAC or roofs or um, uh, the other facilities elements that we ask for and, and the fact that we have an ongoing refresh and replacement schedule for those. Um, for transportation, we have buses in our CIP 
budget rather than in our operating budget. Um, we've tried over the years to put replacement buses in operating. We, we were successful for a couple of years and then the recession hit and back they went into CIP. Um, right now we're purchasing three buses per year and that's to fill a deficit that we have because we purchased seven buses over a two-year period in 2004 and 2005. So we had this sort of bump where all the buses were dying at the same time. Uh, once we get through FY20, we purchase three buses, we should be back on a two bus per year cycle um, and we'll be able to keep those buses safe. And we go uh, based on public works recommendations as to how, what shape our buses are in. They're the folks who maintain them for us and uh, know which one should stay on the road and come off the road. Um, there's one bullet there that says we've got some grant funds coming, which is really interesting. That was, uh, again, thanks to our friends at Public Works. They applied for a VW settlement grant. Um, Y'all might remember in the news that VW got in some trouble for lying about diesel testing. And so as a result, some money's coming down to state government that is to... Um, be used for public vehicles. And so the Public Works Department put in for uh, the cost of a bus and we were, we were awarded a grant which should take, uh, take away about 75% of the cost of that vehicle. We're not exactly sure how much they'll cover, but we have to purchase it up front, so that's why it's in the budget. We have to have the vehicle on site and present an invoice and then uh, we will get uh, grant funds to reimburse that. Any questions? Nutrition Central Office or CIP? Huh? I have a question about, about one. I can. I don't. I don't need that, do I? I can just speak it. I was. I was saying at the break to Nick, the issue with CIP with capital projects, at least for facilities, is that timing is the issue. So, a heat pump at the middle school, there's a six to eight week lead time to order it. If the capital budget is approved in the end of May or the beginning of June and then I get the go-ahead to order the six heat pumps or whatever it's going to be, uh, then I wait for them to arrive. And then, lo and behold, they arrive at the beginning of August, and I have two weeks to get them done. So oftentimes we ask for money this year, and we may not use it in the following year, but because of these odd, the odd timing between what it takes to order something and get it, and the actual time to do it, uh, you kind of have to do it because our, our schedules don't align. And if you look at the way we use our schools in the summer, they are not unoccupied, most of them. So there's not a lot of free time for us to get big, disruptive projects done. <coughs> that's, that's a challenge. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Kathy who's gonna wrap us up. So we've gone a little over our time. So what we're going to do is there was some time for um, adding to the talking points document. We're going to shift that for tomorrow's meeting and put the critical messages to be shared together tomorrow. So the meeting tomorrow, part two, is from 3 to 5.30 here in chambers both A and B. So we have both chambers. So it's from 3 o'clock to 5.30. And so now is a time for um, what worked well in the meeting and what would you change? What are plus deltas? And we will um, take all of these into consideration to um, make next, tomorrow's meeting um, that much more productive. And then there's also an exit slip that will be coming around. Does anybody want to share a plus? <coughs> I love, this. I love that we've split it into two parts because mm. even this amount of time is long. So. And it's a lot to take yeah. in, right? Yeah. Nick? Um, I would just say that I think building in, uh, having this in digestible chunks and building in breaks in between. I mean, no one's ever going to say that a three-hour meeting flew by, but as much as it can, um, as much as it can, I think it did. Um, the only delta I would say, and this is just a matter of space, is that of course it's a challenge to have this many people in a small space, but you know, it, it's not the end of the world. I think we made it work. So. 
If I could add one delta for tomorrow, it's very minor. It's that anybody who's going to be presenting tomorrow, if you could put the page numbers to the budget book up on your slide. I know everybody who presented today did a great job saying, this is on page 17. But if I was writing something down or I missed that, then I was like clumsily thumbing through my book. But if you could just put that up on the slide, that would be very helpful. Any other pluses or deltas? Okay, so tomorrow we won't have breakfast, obviously, because we're meeting at 3, but we'll still have water and snacks. Um, for those of you who have to jump right into the 6 o'clock town council workshop, there will be a meal served, I believe it's soup and salad, yeah. um, which isn't the easiest thing to eat quickly, <laughs> but um, that food will be served upstairs because although we have both chambers tomorrow, they will be transitioning while we're quickly grabbing a bite. And those of you who are not a part of the Eight Corners proposal at the Town Council workshop, you certainly will be able to spread out across our offices up in Central Office and en enjoy your meal for in, um, in preparation for the 7 o'clock Town Council meeting where the town manager and I will be presenting the budget overview. Busy afternoon tomorrow. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. I know that you're probably feeling really saturated with a lot of information. Feel free to add any other questions or wonderings you might have to your exit slip, and we'll collect these before you go. Do you have to adjourn? Oh, yeah. Motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Anyone opposing this? Do we not do? Sounds really disturbing.